You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love all things bookish. If you are looking for book recommendations, please check out the two columns that I write for a wonderful Houston publication, The Buzz Magazines. My weekly column is entitled Page Turners, and I highlight various books and authors and other fun book topics. For my monthly column called Buzz Reads, I choose my top five picks for each month. You can also email me at cindyhburnett at att.net for personalized book recommendations. I get those requests all the time, and I love replying to them. Today, Catherine Senner is joining me to talk about her latest novel, What You Wish For. She's the author of How to Walk Away and Things You Save in a Fire, both instant New York Times bestsellers, as well as The Lost Husband, now a movie starring Josh Duhamel, and five other bittersweet comic novels. She writes laugh and cry novels about how life knocks us down and how we get back up. Catherine lives in her hometown of Houston, Texas, with her husband, two kids, and their fluffy but fierce dog. Now, let's get to it. Welcome, Catherine Center. I'm so glad that you're here today, and I can't wait to talk about what you wish for. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for thinking of me. Of course. I wouldn't miss it. So <laughs> let's start out and tell me about your latest book. It's called What You Wish For, and it is kind of a story about learning how to choose joy on purpose. I think ultimately that that's the best way to sum it up in one sentence. It's a sort of half tragedy, half comedy kind of story, which is like the kind of story that I really like to write. It's, it's people who have to sort of struggle with some actual real hard things in their lives, but they struggle with those things by cracking a lot of jokes and being funny. And it's set in Texas. It's set in Galveston, um, on Galveston Island, which is one of my favorite places on earth. And I've always wanted to set a story down there. And it's about a school librarian named Samantha. She goes by Sam, who is, she gets the worst new boss in the world. (laughs) And he turns out to be a former crush. But he's changed a lot since she knew him 10 years before. And so part part of the question of the story, part of what she's wondering and we're all trying to figure out is what happened to him? Why did he change so much? And she's got a lot of stuff to kind of work through, and he's got a lot of stuff to work through, and they butt heads a lot, but they wind up kind of helping each other too. And I think that's a pretty good summary. I'm not sure I've got my like elevator pitch <laughs> worked out yet on the story, but it's a kind of a, it's really a story about facing hard things, but letting yourself hold on to good things in that process, not getting so caught up in the struggle that you can't feel joy and feel connected to happiness. And I think it's a pretty good message for right now in history. (laughs) Just going to say that. I've seen your posts and some of your talking about the choosing joy and joy. And I think that is a very relevant message for right now because, I mean, this endlessly sitting at home, it's hard not to get down. And so I think the idea of focusing on the positive and choosing joy is incredibly relevant. Yeah. and, And that is not something that I am actually good at naturally, you know, I mean, I tend to just start with death in any situation (laughs) and kind of work my way backwards. And so, you know, having a a protagonist who has to work on that is satisfying for me. It was satisfying for me to write. I think it's satisfying for me to read too, because it's like, you get to kind of go through that process with her. Like I've kind of spent my entire adult life trying to get better at savoring good things, paying attention to good things, you know, not ignoring them, not being so focused on everything that's wrong all the time that I forget to appreciate what's right. And that's what Sam has to do in this, in this book. And I feel like there, there are a lot of good lessons there. I mean, for me as well about, yeah, everything's sort of collapsing around you, but how do you find ways to laugh anyway, right? How do you find reasons to have a dance party anyway. There's kind of an epic dance party. (laughs) (laughs) And just staying positive, you know, and I think our society, especially with the news cycle, the way it is, things focus on the negative. And so you're right. You have to really try to flip it around and think about the positive, focus on the positive and try to be happy. And I love that it's set in Galveston because it's always fun to read about an area near your home and a Texas uh, locale is an added benefit. Yeah, it's Galveston's such a great town and there's not 
that many books, TV shows, stories that are set down there. And it always feels like a missed opportunity to me. So I've been thinking for years about how can I get a, get a book going down there. So it's good. I'm excited. Uh, how did you come up with the subject matter for this one? Well, actually, I read a book maybe a year or two ago, a nonfiction book that I totally fell in love with. I mean, I had that really special experience that you sometimes get when you read just the right book at the right moment where I felt like it had like pulled back the curtains for me on my own life. I like I read this nonfiction book and I was like, that's why I do all that stuff. Like it <laughs> explained me to me in this crazy new way. It, the book is called Joyful and I'm going to, it's got a subheading that I'm going to forget, but it's like, it's something like um, the power of ordinary things to create extraordinary happiness. Is this the one that was just in your newsletter? Yes. Okay. Yes. I yes. thought I remembered that because it looked like an interesting book when I saw it coming, you know, I was reading your newsletter and I thought, yeah. oh, I need to pick that one up. I am obsessed with that book. It's a problem. <laughs> and uh, like, I can't, like for a long time, I couldn't talk about anything else. Like if you <laughs> have the misfortune of running me into the grocery <laughs> store, I would just be like, let me stop you for three hours. And tell you I'd be like, so, Run. she's talking about that book again. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. Like I, 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 that's a problem with me. I get like, I fall in love with things, you know, and I get obsessed with things. It's usually good things. And, uh, and then that's all I want to talk about for a really long time. I always think about you and Outlander. So every oh. time Outlander comes across my screen on Netflix, which I still have not watched yet, but it always, I'm at Catherine Center because every, the first couple times I ever heard about it was from you talking about it. The book, I'm like, I was totally obsessed with the book. Yes. I did not get as obsessed with the TV show oh, okay. because what I noticed about myself on the TV show, I was given homework to watch the TV show by Jodi Picoult. I went to dinner with her and I told her that I had loved the books, but I had never seen the TV show. And she was like, you got to see the TV show. So I was like, all right, if Jodi Picot tells you to do yeah, something, you do you it. Do that thing. But what's funny to me is that I, it, it was actually, this is such a great reader conversation because it really called my attention to how reading a book is such a collaboration between the reader and the writer. And the reader really has a lot of agency when they're reading. And what I found is that in, in Outlander, there's a lot of parts of that book that are like kind of just a straight up romance novel. Like there's a lot of like love story components to that book. And then there's a lot of like frightening psychopath oh. thriller <laughs> elements to it. And what I discovered about myself watching the TV show is that I really skimmed the psychopath. Like oh, that's interesting. I just skimmed right over that. And I barely even remembered that. Like I remembered the book as like a delightful romp through the Scottish Highland, <laughs> you know, like I, I just blocked out the psychopath entirely, but that, but Netflix, they go there or no, whoever made the, whoever I made think it show. is Netflix because okay. I haven't watched it yet, but it always pops up in my, yeah. you would like this one kind of thing. And yeah. every single time I'm like Catherine center. <laughs> Whoever made that show, they really decided to just hang out with that psychopath. Like he gets <laughs> so much screen time and he's really a great actor. And like those scenes are complicated and interesting, but I wound up fast forwarding through them because I was just like too much psychopath. Yeah. Like, I want the not romance. A good ratio Wait. of love to psychopath. <laughs> so, yeah, so I loved this book, Joyful, and it was a nonfiction read, but it was all about how, how joy is not necessarily some big monolithic emotion, right? That it's more just about little tiny, um, fluttery little bits and pieces of things that you can kind of collect more and more of in your life. Like kind of like the difference between like turning on a room with a giant light overhead versus like filling up a room with twinkle lights, you know? And it really got me thinking about how you can kind of fill up your life with little twinkle lights of joy and and how I've kind of been trying to do that my whole life just trying to cheer myself up trying to help myself be okay in all kinds of situations by having all kinds of brightly colored things all around me and painting flowers all the time and keeping a garden you know she's kind of got this list of things that we do that are kind of inherently joyful in human life and I was like check 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 and I found myself wanting to talk about joy. Like, I think that's a really important topic. I think in the literary world, we do not shy away from talking about misery, but I don't know that we really talk enough about joy. And so that I decided to try and create a story that would allow me to write about joy and to talk about joy and to examine it. Like, how does it work and why does it matter? And, and so really it was kind of a very conscious 
um, attempt to kind of get at a very abstract idea through specifics, through the specific story. Oh, I love that. And I agree with that completely. I was actually just talking with someone else about that earlier today, that I feel like there's such a focus on the dreariness and, you know, horrible things happening. And I just like, yeah, especially right now, I don't want to read all of that. Like I would prefer to read some stuff that will take me away in a positive way and not add to the stress I'm already feeling. You know, I think your life really winds up being very much what you pay attention to. Right? I agree. And so if, yeah. if we're just always paying attention to misery and ennui and psychopaths, then that's <laughs> kind of what your life is filled up with. And I, I know there is some of that in life. Like I'm not in denial that, that there are downsides and there's plenty of darkness, but I'm also trying in my own actual real life and also in my books, I'm trying to value paying attention to good things, you know, paying attention to joy and paying attention to comfort and paying attention to moments when people take care of each other. I mean, there are so many examples in life of people being horrible. You don't have to look very hard for that, right? <laughs> like but watch the I'm news to, for 30 minutes, yeah. I know. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is write stories that are rooted in authentic human experiences, but that also are hopeful, right? Yeah. That also kind of at least at least hope for the possibility that human beings are going to find some way to reach their potential, right? And, and, and be kind to each other and take care of each other. So I'm just trying to focus on that. And I think that we, I think if we don't ever take things like love and kindness and human compassion seriously, we're never going to get good at those things. We, I think as a culture, we have a tendency to kind of roll our eyes at that stuff. Yeah. And, but I don't. I want to be good at love. I want to be good at human compassion. I want to be good at caretaking and tenderness and vulnerability and all of those sort of sweet elements of human life that we sometimes bypass for psychopaths. So <laughs> I'm trying to write about that stuff. Well, it's the glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing. And yeah. I think unfortunately today it's harder to be a glass half full kind of person and to try to find the positive. So that's great. We need more like that out there. Yeah, thank you. So I think I know the answer to this, but for you, what comes first, the plot or the characters? Whoa. Do you know the answer to that? Well, um, I think, but I'm, I'm curious to hear because sometimes I'll be able to absolutely know the answer. And as I was thinking about it with you, I'm like, well, I think it's the characters, but maybe, maybe the plot lines up more with joy. I don't know. What do you think? Okay. I think what I would say to that very good question is I think the characters come more easily to me than the plot does because I just kind of hear them talking in my head. Right. And I don't even have to try to write dialogue. It's just like taking dictation. It's super I remember easy. you had said that, that they just kind of come to you. Yeah. But, and plot is much harder for me. Those sort of big decisions of like, you know, where do we start? Where do we go? What is the kind of roller coaster shape of the story need to be so that it gives people the right emotional experience in the right way? That's a harder question for me. And so because plot is harder for me, I actually tend to do it first. First. Oh, that's if, if that makes sense. Because yeah. I don't want to start writing right. until I know what the shape of the story is going to be, until I know what the big plot elements need to be so that the story can kind of light itself up from the inside. And so, you know, I don't ever worry about characters or dialogue. Like, I, I don't even think about it. It's just once you've got the right pieces in place for the plot, everything else just kind of happens like magic. But the well, plot so is something I really have to think about. Okay, and, so I and... guessed wrong. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Well, but I think your guess was based on this idea that you think that I like characters and dialogue better and they're easier for me, which is definitely true, but I just don't get started on them until I've done the hard part. Well, I like that answer. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know how much I like titles and covers and your covers are fabulous. And I love the theme that has worked at least for the last three. Um, and has it, is it just the last three? Have you gone back and done the earlier ones too now? They're going to reissue okay. Happiness for Beginners with a new cover in oh. September, I think. Yeah, oh, that has to make you happy. I'm thrilled. Because <laughs> I know you didn't absolutely love that cover. Um, I didn't love it. But I love these last three. And I think it's great because the second you see it, you know it's a Catherine Center book. And so do you? I know early on, like with um, How to Walk Away, that you worked a lot with them on the size of the type and all of that. Are you still doing the same thing or do they kind of send it to you ready to go these days? Um, no, they've been actually really great about talking to me about cover stuff. I mean, they're just, 
I love them. Now, I was at a different publisher earlier in my career, and now I'm at St. Martin's, which is part of Macmillan. And I just, I'm obsessed with them. I love them. <laughs> I want to like pitch a tent outside their building and throw flowers at them every day as they come and go to the office. <laughs> they would um, love that. They're the greatest. I love them so much. And I actually got to meet the lady who designed that sort of iconic How to Walk oh. Away cover a couple of years ago. I was in New York and I went to the, to the Macmillan office and I met her. And I just like hugged her around the neck. And I wouldn't let go. She was like, <laughs> she's like, it's like, okay now. <laughs> yeah. She was like, sweetheart, you got to let me go. I was like, I'll never let you go. Um, you know, she changed my life with that cover. Yeah, you know? I, I do agree. That cover is amazing, which yeah. has then led to these next couple of covers. And yeah. you just see it and you automatically know it is you and it's beautiful. And I, I agree completely. And I'm so grateful because when when we were going from How to Walk Away to Things You Save in a Fire, which was the book that came right afterwards, there was a question of like, okay, we're going to keep the same typeface and we're going to kind of keep the same vibe, but should we put something on it other than flowers? And we just tried a bunch of things to see. And after a while, we finally decided that there was nothing better than flowers, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, we were like, fine. And I was like, look, here's the thing. Let's just do flowers forever. Let's just yeah. do flowers forever. Right. And yeah. so we wound up on Things You Save in a Fire. It was kind of great because we took the flowers, the same exact flowers. We made them in the color of fire. So we made them all in tones of like orange and red. And right, yellow, right. Because it's a book about a fire, a lady right. firefighter. And, but then, you know, once we had done those two together with the flowers, we were like, all right, yeah, we'll just do flowers forever, which has been great for me because I, I'm very crafty and I love to do yeah. artistic things, but I'm not like a great artist. You know, I haven't like studied in Paris, <laughs> but I can paint flowers. You know, I can paint a decent flower. And so ever since these books happened with these amazing covers, I, kinds of flower related art where I'm like painting on people's books for them with Blue Willow Bookshop during the pandemic I've been painting hand painted book plates and just mailing them to Blue Willow for literally any Catherine Center book you buy from them from now through the end of August it comes with a flower book plate painted from me I've seen the photos of that in your newsletter and on Instagram and I think that's great it ties in so well and it's fun yeah, you know? yeah. and happy <laughs> It's, yeah, it's joy. happy and mm-hmm. it's joyful and it's something I can do. You know, if it were if it were tanks, army tanks on the cover <laughs> of my books, which would never which happen. Which would go so well with your <laughs> with your storyline. I wouldn't know how to paint that, you know, but with a flower, you can't go wrong with a flower. I mean, if you put enough colors on it, it's going to be beautiful. So it's very low pressure and it's been a lot of fun. So I'm super grateful for those covers. Well, and when we were doing in-person events, which seems like a hundred years ago right now, when we hosted you and you brought the flowers and we all put them in our hair and made the different ones. I mean, it's just such a fun thing to tie in either whether it's book plates or flowers for people to put in their hair or bookmarks or whatever. It's a fun tie-in. I agree. So tell me about the title. Of this new book, What You Wish For. How you came up with that. Oh my gosh, how did I come up with that title? I had several working titles for this book and they kind of, they, I would think they were working and then they wouldn't work. I would, I would be like, this is it, I think. And then like a couple of weeks later, I'd be like, you know what? Nope, nope, that's not the right thing. <laughs> and towards the end of the process, it was really, so this was last summer because they kind of get started on new books for like the next year, kind of summer before. Um, you know, it was time, you know, for my editor to kind of tell the folks, you know, on the team what the book was going to be called. (laughs) And so time was running out. I could see the sands in the hourglass kind of getting low. And at that point, my editor and I were just emailing back and forth, like anything, everything sounded like a title, you know, like my (laughs) husband would be like, I'm going to the grocery store. And I'll be like, that's the title. And then I'd email it to her like two in the morning being like, what about I'm going to the grocery store? And she'd email back and be like, that is terrible. I don't think that's quite it. (laughs) So it was really like towards the end, there is a moment when you've been thinking of everything as a title for so long that you can't tell what's good and what's not anymore. So yeah, I, I'm loving this title now. Like I feel like it really fits with the book and it's easy to say and it's pretty on the cover and I love all those W's. And so I think in the end, it did turn out to be the right cover uh, title, but that was kind of lucky because it could have been, it probably could have been 10 other titles as we like were panting. what you do when you go to the grocery store. So tell me a little bit about the movie and all of that. That's so exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. So my fourth novel, which came out in 2013, so a long time ago, 
got turned into a movie and it just came out in April, right at the start of the pandemic. And it stars Josh Dumel and Leslie Bibb. And, you know, we were, it was like, it's like a movie movie, like a real movie. <laughs> I know, it was great. It was slated to have a big theatrical release all across the country. There was going to be a big premiere in LA. There were all kinds of exciting things that were going to happen. I was going to go to that red carpet and get a <laughs> selfie with Josh Jamel. And then, uh, and then the pandemic happened when everything wound up getting canceled. It never wound up in theaters because there were no theaters and it just went straight to streaming. It came out April 10th. And it was that was kind of disappointing, I mean, in a way. But I will also say that at the time, I was so panicked about the pandemic that I was like, I don't even care. Everybody <laughs> get inside. <Yeah. laughs> and watch my movie while you're inside. But actually, it did wind up being this thing where I felt like, you know, we're all trapped inside. We're all miserable and freaked out. Like, actually, this lovely, hopeful, pastoral, beautiful movie that they made turned out to be this kind of lovely gift that we could give to everybody who was trapped in quarantine. And it actually, right after it came out, it wound up the number one independent movie in America. I don't think I knew that. That's so exciting. True. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, I saw it everywhere and I yeah. knew, you know, all of our friends were watching it and I saw people posting a lot about it, but I did not realize that. That's so exciting. Well, uh, yeah. I mean. The other really cool thing about getting to be in that I mean, getting to do that movie was that they let me come and be an extra. So I got to go and spend a day on the set and I got to meet Josh Dumel and I got to meet Leslie Bibb and that felt very glamorous. Oh, that had to be so exciting because it was filmed outside of Austin. Is that right? Or in Austin? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they picked a whole bunch of cute little places around Texas, all these cute little towns. And then they filmed a farmer's market scene in Austin at, at an actual farmer's market in got Austin. It. And we got to spend a day there. And actually they filmed a totally epic kiss between Josh Jamel and Leslie Bibb on the day that I was there. Oh, that's um, exciting. And I felt very proud of myself. <laughs> I was like, I invented that kiss, y'all. Like, that's because of me. And I made this. <laughs> when you watch the movie, when he grabs her by the snaps on her overalls at the farmer's market and plants the most delicious kiss in the history of cinema on her, just know that I am standing there in that scene. <laughs> you can't see me. I'm on the other side of his shoulder, but right behind Josh Jamel's shoulder is me trying so hard not to look and be like, oh my God, they're the cutest. <laughs> You're beaming ear to ear going, this is so exciting. It, totally was. <laughs> it was awesome. So on that, that leads to another question I had for you. Do you have a favorite of your books and do you have a favorite character that you've written or is your favorite just kind of the one you're working on now? I know sometimes for people, they get so invested in whatever it is they're working on at the moment that that becomes their favorite. Or do you have one you return to and think, I just absolutely love that particular book? It is true that I'm always very much in love with whatever story I'm working on at the moment. Um, I love... I would say, I mean, this is a kind of a terrible answer, but I love all of my most recent books. I think I love them all kind of equally. I mean, I love The Lost Husband for having become a movie. <laughs> sure. And, and I love How to Walk Away, Things You Save in a Fire, Happiness for Beginners, which was my first book that I did with Macmillan. And then this new book, which is connected to Happiness for Beginners, actually. I think I forgot to mention that, but it's there's a minor character in Happiness for Beginners that sort of comes back and gets to have a kind of starring role in this new book. I love all of these books, these newer books in different ways. And I think that one thing that I've really tried to do in my sort of career, because it's been a while now, you know, I published my first novel in 2007. So I've been at it for, you know, my kids were babies when I started and now they're <laughs> taller than me. So I, I tried to get better, but better has a very specific meaning to me because for me, what better means is I've tried to get clearer and clearer to myself about what it is that I love in a story as a reader. So I think when I was younger, I thought that there was kind of an objective sort of good out there. And then there was an objective bad. And I think I thought it was all kind of linear, like some stories were just better and some stories were worse and that it was all in a kind of a straight line. And now, you know, the older I get, the more I feel like there are all different kinds of good. And there are all different kinds of stories that are trying to do all different kinds of things to you. And whether or not a story works depends very much on what the author's trying to do to you. And so for me, getting clearer and clearer about what I want to do to people, how I want to make them feel as they're moving through the story, what I want them to think about, what I want them to be rooting for and hoping for and worried about, 
knowing what I like when I'm reading a story and then trying to do that for other people, for me, that's getting better. And, right. and it is true as I get older and older and pay more and more attention to that, I think I'm getting better at doing the things for other people that I like having done to me. And so I really see it now as kind of something that, that I do in the spirit of service for other people. <laughs> You're doing community <laughs> service. <laughs> yeah, because if you like the kind of book that I like, right. then I'm basically just giving you like the best present I can possibly give you, right? Which is just right. like curl up with a fuzzy blanket and a hot cup of tea and just feel all the feels and enjoy. My early books, I was just trying to be, a, quote unquote, a good writer. And right. now... I'm trying to be a very specific kind of good writer that does a very specific set of things to you while you're reading. Well, and that's interesting that you say that because I feel like I have been involved with the book world, reviewing, reading. I mean, I've always read, but but more involved on the reviewing side of it and actively reading and reviewing and things like that. And then I feel like the longer I do that, the more I have learned. And I feel like, you know, I used to read maybe a particular book and I'd be like, oh, that wasn't very good. But I have realized there are a million people out there and a million writers. And it's not that it's not good. It's just not good for me or it's not where I am in my life. And I think it's a good lesson to realize there are a lot of different writers, a lot of different readers, and different things will resonate with different people. And I think that's a great lesson to learn. And so now when I sometimes hear somebody, that was a terrible book about whatever it was, I'm like, I don't think it's a terrible book. It was just maybe not a great book for you for whatever it is, you know, personal experiences or you're in the middle of a pandemic or you've had something close like that happen. You know, so I think it's interesting to kind of think through that there are a lot of different readers, a lot of different writers and realize that what appeals to somebody might not appeal to somebody else and that you like a particular type of book. So then you want to write something like that. I always enjoy talking to you so much and I know we need to wrap up, but I'd love to hear about what you've read lately that you loved. Okay, I've read some good stuff. I got to read Angie Kim's Miracle Creek earlier this summer, and I loved it. I I heard that that about that one. I've heard that over and over again. I need to read it because I I do keep hearing that. Yeah, you will will like it. I mean, I think knowing what I know about what you like, um, I think you'll like it. And then uh, the other great book that I read, like the big standout for me of the summer is actually a nonfiction book about stories. And it's called The Science of Storytelling. And it's really about kind of the neurobiology of how stories function in the human brain. And I, of course, am always interested. I've read every single book that's ever been written on how to write a story because I'm just sort of endlessly fascinated by the magic of how all that stuff works. Um, So I'm an obvious um, target audience for that book. But actually, it was such a great book. Well, as always, I very much love talking to you today. And thank you for taking the time to come talk about what you wish for. Oh man, I loved it. I'm so glad you had me. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast and tell all your friends about the Thoughts from a Page podcast. What You Wish For can be purchased at Murder by the Book, where I work part-time. Thanks as always to KP Regan for the sound editing, and thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts.